I want your soul. My mind had shattered, slowly and methodically, into confused fragments and tiny, shrieking pieces. I remember days just laying in bed, not eating, staring at the ceiling. I remember the skittering of the shadow people in the corners, but most of all, I remember the voices screaming at me all the time. It was my mother's voice most of all, that insane, grating cry. Wet your bed again, and I'll cut it off, she screamed harshly. The voice seemed to come from all around me, shaking the walls and the ceiling, but I was still laying alone in my bed. No one else was here. Logically, a part of myself knew it, but I could still hear her shrieking voice, that lunatic, raspy shrieking. I remember the first time my mother ever caught me stealing a piece of candy as a little boy. She dragged me, crying and pleading, into the kitchen. And then she turned the oven burner on high and grabbed my hand. Now this is going to teach you, you little shit, she hissed as she quickly pushed my hand down. I think the screams from that day echoed across the decades, and that sometimes even now, I still hear them. The door downstairs clicked and jiggled. I felt like a statue in the bed, emaciated and dirty. The ceiling seemed to be opening up into another world. A ragged patch about seven feet across crumbled down, revealing a paradise with rainbows and bright green rolling hills and puffy clouds beyond. But in this dank place, my flesh body stayed and rotted, surrounded by garbage and filthy dishes with larvae squirming on them. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw policemen and paramedics rushing in, their cold, attentive eyes quickly scanning the room. Mixed with them, though, the shadow people skittered and writhed. They grabbed me, but I couldn't tell if the hands were the flesh of humanity or the cold void of the shadow people. I looked up at the opening in the ceiling. It seemed to wave me forward. I felt myself floating out of my body toward the land of milk and honey as the blue skies and eternal sunshine there beckoned me forwards. I glanced back. The shadow people swarmed all over my filthy, broken flesh shell, but I knew I had escaped their clutches. Working together, the paramedics and shadow beings took my body away, but I felt grateful knowing I had just left behind a fate worse than death. Time passed, but I don't know how much. I lived in the world of forever sunshine and clear streams and endless forests. I would glance back through the opening occasionally, seeing my body made of meat still laying there. Men in white coats stood among the shadow people in a brightly lit clean room with curtains. The shadow people took their razor sharp fingers and traced invisible sickness all over my body. Other shadow people gnashed and clawed at the men in the white coats. I knew that their attacks didn't leave the physical marks. They were more like radiation in a way. If a shadow person reached inside someone's body and traced its dagger-like finger across their liver, that person would have liver failure or liver cancer within months. I've seen it happen many times. They attacked me all over. With each brutal assault, it seemed like I lost more and more of myself. I turned away, sickened. I would always return back towards the land of sunshine and rolling hills, but as I looked around there, it seemed more like prison than ever before. I was alone in these forests, set to wander under the beautiful springtime hills for eternity. Perhaps this place was hell. Perhaps instead of fire, it used boredom to burn, just like a prison. I heard the men in the white coats speaking through the opening that always followed behind me. It's a rather severe case of catatonia with catalepsy and mutism, one of them with glasses said. He has a prior diagnosis of schizophrenia, but it seems to have gotten much, much worse. Aha! Does he have any past history of catatonia? The bald man in a white coat asked. The man with glasses then shook his head, looking grimly down at my body made of meat. The rest of the men looked on with slightly bored expressions. One turned and left the room, jotting something down on a clipboard. The shadow creatures followed close behind, twisting and thrashing on the walls and ceilings like salamanders from hell. 
No, no reported history of mutism or waxy flexibility or any other typical signs. The man with glasses responded, giving a low sigh. Well, he's not responding to benzodiazepines, so we'll start him on electroconvulsive therapy and continue the lorazepam for now. We'll also keep the feeding tube in. Oh, so what are you putting down as the official diagnosis, Doc? The bald one asked. The man with glasses then wrote something down on his clipboard. Withdrawn catatonia resulting from severe, untreated paranoid schizophrenia. We'll have to get an involuntary commitment form signed by a judge. Tell the nurses to rustle up an extra inpatient bed in psych. This one's going to need it. The next few days slipped by as before. I watched them wheel my body into a room with lots of machines. They put a robin's egg blue mouth guard with a breathing hole in between my teeth. They rubbed a gel on my forehead and started attaching circular electrodes to my skin. The shadow monsters flitting around seemed to laugh and dance. They supposedly give ECT patients drugs to put them to sleep, but I saw the whole thing from that other world. Perhaps there are more things in existence than doctors ever dreamed possible. I watched my body jerk in seizure after seizure as the electricity hit. I felt myself being ripped from the dream world I had inhabited. I fell through the opening towards my silent, thin body. It lay there as pale and still as a corpse. As we rejoined, I thought I could hear the laughing of the shadow people again. Ah, I groaned. My eyes flew open. I saw time had passed, though I had no idea how much. I wasn't in that surgical room anymore with the kicking, seizing surges of electricity and the doctors who showed far too many teeth in their smiles. Now I was alone. Every part of my body seemed to hurt. My back shrieked at me as stabbing pains ran up and down my spine. I sat up suddenly in the darkness, looking around. I was laying on a thin mattress in a room with oppressive, brutalist concrete walls. I blinked quickly, my eyes adjusting slightly. A thin trickle of light came in through a window. Metal bars crisscrossed it. Outside, I saw the bloody red glow of a sunset, or maybe it was a sunrise. The dark crimson light streamed down through roll after roll of razor wire and high, sharp fences. I stumbled out of bed toward the door, ripping it open. Bright fluorescent light streamed into the suffocating gray room. They flickered and strobed, casting eerie shadows, dancing up and down halfway. I didn't see a single person. Empty medical carts stood on the sides. Bloody scalpels and knives were thrown haphazardly on top of one. I saw the drawers ripped open, some of them broken off. One of the half-cocked, crooked drawers contained dismembered human fingers, lined up carefully like an open package of hot dogs. Used needles and chunks of broken brick and cement littered the gray floors. I also saw splatters of something red and chunks of what looked like liver. Flies swarmed around them and a sudden wave of fetid reek reached me as I stood on the threshold. I backed up, nearly vomiting. I retched for a moment, my eyes watering as I breathed through my mouth, trying not to smell it. I looked back into the room, realizing there was a sign above the bed, one I hadn't seen in the darkness. It looked ancient and was covered in thick layers of dust and yellowing nicotine stains. I squinted, getting closer and closer, trying to read it. Rules for patients' well-being and survival while in Whiting Psychiatric Hospital. Rule number one, do not leave doors open. That invites them in. Rule number two, if you go into the key room, get out before the guard notices you. Rule number three, you must make an offering of raw meat to the keeper if you wish to pass from one level to another on the stairwell. I stared for a few interminable seconds at the sign, wondering what the punchline was and wondering what in the fuck was going on here. I looked around expecting someone to jump out and try to scare me or perhaps announce that it was all a prank and being recorded. But nothing changed. Still imprisoned in the cube of gray concrete with ancient strobing lights streaming in from the hallway, I felt the sudden coldness run through my body. I glanced at the open door with a 
shrinking feeling in my chest. For a brief moment in the flickering lights, I thought I saw a pale face with wide, excited eyes peeking around the corner. The fluorescent lights made tink-tink-tink sounds as they strobed in the hallway, sending their eerie glare into every corner of the room. Hello? I whispered, tiptoeing towards the door. Is somebody... I was cut off by an eerie, congested breathing, a long, raspy inhalation, as if a corpse with dirt and worms in its throat had just come back to life. My heart raced at a hundred miles an hour, beating hard in my ears. Dax, the voice gurgled, calling my name. I heard more ragged, choked breathing faintly echoing from further down the hall. I backpedaled quickly, looking for some sort of a weapon, but everything was bolted to the ground, even the bed. Unless I wanted to try suffocating these eldritch creatures with a thin hospital pillow, there was absolutely nothing of use in this room. My mind flashed back to the medical cart in the hallway with bloody scalpels and surgical instruments littered over the top of it. A long white arm reached around the corner of the door. Breathing hard, I put my head down and sprinted straight for the medical cart. It was so close, maybe only 20 feet away, but at the time, that 20 feet seemed like 20 miles. I heard a choked gasp as the unknown creature lunged forward, wrapping its cold, pale arms around my neck. I glimpsed the deep, sores eating into the flesh, the way the bones poked out through the tips of the fingers. Maggots writhed and black necrotic gashes dug into its skin. I saw long black hair fall over my vision and smelled the odor of rotten tomatoes and decaying meat. And though this happened a few days ago, I did end up escaping that wretched place. Sometimes I think I smell that fetid odor in the air, and my heart goes cold. Dax. It hissed in my ear as it wrapped its freezing hands around my neck. Give me your warmth. I tried throwing the thing off as it squeezed, cutting my breath off. In panic, I thrashed my arms, slowly pulling the corpse towards the medical cart. I tried reaching back and gouging out its eyes, but my fingers just kept sliding off the dead, loose flesh. Further down the hall, I saw three more pale white figures limping slowly towards the commotion like moths drawn to a flame. I got a good look at them, realizing they had once been women with long black hair. Now they looked like the walking dead. Deep gashes ran through their skin. Autopsy stitches ran up and down their chests. They had on light green hospital gowns, stained with a rainbow of fluids that I couldn't even try to identify, though a lot of it was clearly blood. Their eyes had taken on a filmy, faded look. Their plodding, limping steps brought them incrementally closer as their eyes twitched to the left and to the right. I was still too far from the cart, and I knew I had lost. My vision started to turn black as the fingers tightened, fingers whose skin was falling off. The sharp claws of bone dug into my neck. I would have screamed, but I had no air. Then something heavy and fast hit us, and we both went flying. The fingers flew off my neck. I looked up, seeing a giant man with a dark cross-eyed stare. He was breathing hard, his chest heaving as he looked down at the pale, undead woman who had tried to strangle me. I saw he was wearing the garb of a patient at a psych ward, a white t-shirt and khaki pants with slippers. I looked down, realizing I was wearing the same outfit. Someone must have changed my clothes while I was unconscious. With a lunatic gleam on his face, he stared down at me in the undead abomination. He was holding a gleaming buck knife, soaked with fresh blood. He ran forward and I screamed. But he didn't attack me. With a crunching sound, he brought the knife down through the undead woman's milky left eye. It pierced deep into her skull with a soft cracking of bone and the sound of spurting blood. Her legs kicked and twisted for a couple moments as she writhed on the filthy gray floor. Pieces of broken glass and the tips of used needles 
dug into her loose white flesh. Black blood poured out of the wounds, a waterfall of it gushing from her head. The man reached down, pulling his knife out with a sickening, sucking sound. He put out one giant calloused hand toward me and I quickly grabbed it. With strength like an ox, he ripped me up off the ground. We need to get out of here, he said in a low tone. He pushed me forward, down the hallway in the opposite direction from the rest of the undead women, who were now only a couple steps away. Run, he shouted. Even though my head was pounding and I was terrified and confused, I sprinted for my life. The large man was faster than me, and I ended up following him down the hallway. It split to the left and the right, but he seemed to know where he was going. He veered to the left and pushed open a cracked door around the corner whose sign read, Janitorial Closet. After ushering me inside, he slammed it shut and turned the deadbolt. We found ourselves in total darkness until he pulled on a string hanging next to a bare incandescent bulb. Its light covered the small closet in a dim yellow glow. The man extended his left hand toward me. I shook it, wincing as his iron grip crushed the bones in my palm. I'm Freddy, he said. One of his eyes stared at the wall while the other looked at me. His right hand still gripped the knife tightly. The blood dripping off the point of the blade made soft, repetitive tapping sounds as they smacked against the ground. You must have a death wish leaving your door open like that. I'm Dax, and I just got here, and I had no idea those things would be in the hallways, peeking around corners. I then heard something sharp being dragged lightly against the side of the door. I could imagine those horrific undead women dragging their rotted claw-like fingers over the surface of the battered wood only a few inches away. I thought I could hear the faintest trace of a gurgling breath, and I shuddered. So, I guess those rules are real, huh? Freddy's face then darkened like an approaching thundercloud as I brought up the list of rules, and he nodded grimly. They are as real and as serious as death, he said. I don't know who put them up, but they're the only reason I've stayed alive this long. They're in every patient's room. How did you get here? I then told Freddy about the catatonic state I had gotten trapped in the land of eternal sunshine and the shadow people, the electroconvulsive therapy I had seen my own body subject to, and finally, waking up here. There was a lady in my town. She had real bad mental problems. Real bad, he said, shaking his head. She used to get catatonia, too. We had a few statues and wells downtown. It was just a small town, but what town doesn't have a few statues, right? I nodded. Well, the lady used to walk over slowly and confusedly, almost like a robot that doesn't know how to use its legs. Once she got near a statue, she would just freeze. Sometimes she would have one arm bent upwards at a 90 degree angle, or she would be posed like the Statue of Liberty. He started giggling then. And she would just stay like that forever if you left her, you know what I mean? Till she died or collapsed or whatever, obviously. But someone would have to come and get her. They'd have a couple strong guys come and pick her up and put her in the back of a car. When they carried her out, it looked like they were carrying out an actual statue. She would be stiff and rigid as a mannequin. And sometimes my family would drive through downtown and she'd be out there, stiff as a statue. And my daddy would say, Ah, oh, God damn it. There's old Becky again, doing her rigor mortis routine. And I would laugh, but deep inside, a piece of me cried too. Because even though it was kind of funny to me back then as a kid, I knew something was seriously wrong and disturbing about the whole thing. I mean, she would literally stand there until she froze to death if someone didn't come get her. I nodded at his story, feeling suddenly very tired. Is there any food or water around here? My head is pounding, I said, grabbing my forehead and rubbing rhythmically in circles to try to relieve the horrific migraine, pulsating hot agony in time with my heart. Well... There's the cafeteria on the ground floor, but we'd have to go through the stairwell. You're on the third floor right now, you see, and it's no big deal, really, but... I remembered the rules and then smiled. But we need to fetch some eldritch beasts with raw meat, right? I asked, giving him a small smile. He nodded. He reached into his pocket and pulled out another bloodstained folding knife, handing it over to me first. 
We can just cut a chunk out of that corpse in the hallway, he responded blankly, not showing a shred of emotion as he talked about feeding human meat to the stairway master. He's not so bad, really, or it, I guess, because I'm not even sure if those things have males and females. They just are. Well, what does that mean? I asked, my curiosity mixed with a sense of dread, and he just shook his head. Well, you'll see in a minute, won't you? Come on, let's go get some water. I could use a drink too, and you don't want to try drinking out of the sinks in the bathrooms. Last time I did that, they started gushing warm, salty blood, and I nearly threw up. He wrinkled his face as if the memory of that experience still left a nasty taste in his mouth. Yeah, all right, thanks for the tip, I said as he unlocked the door and we went out in the hallway and back into danger. Freddy went to the corpse of the undead woman. She lay sprawled out on the hallway, a spreading pool of black blood surrounding her pale, lifeless form. Her milky eyes stared sightlessly up at the fluorescent lights as they continued their interminable strobing. All right, let's do this, Freddy said. I glanced up and down the hallway, seeing no sign of the wandering undead corpses. We made sure to close the door tightly behind us. I hoped that following the rules would be enough to keep those abominations away, but I had my doubts. A pound of flesh, I whispered. The hallway was deathly silent except for the tinkering of the lights overhead. Freddy gave me a strange look. Shakespeare, you know. Apparently he didn't. He just shrugged and knelt down. Without a moment of hesitation, he started sawing through the dead woman's hand. The bone is always the hardest part, he said apathetically, as if he were talking about cutting up a Thanksgiving turkey. I watched in sickened fascination as he sawed through the flesh. Then he grabbed a random bedpan, flung onto the side of the dirty hallway floor, put it under her hand, and smashed his foot down on her wrist. The bone cracked with a sound like a muted gunshot. With a smile of accomplishment, he knelt down, picking up the hand. What are you doing here, Freddy? I asked suddenly. He looked up, his face glowing. I mean, not here necessarily, but... I killed my girlfriend, he said simply. Well, she was cheating on me. I found her and the guy and shot them both in the head. I remember how my fingers traced the exit wounds under the moonlight, how they still seemed... His eyes stared a thousand miles away, then he abruptly snapped back, heaving a deep sigh. They found me criminally insane. I think the nail in the coffin was the, uh... He hesitated for a long moment. The blood I drank from her body. I gave him a sideways glance and then waited for the punchline. Uh, what? I said. You, you drank her blood? He nodded grimly, his brown cross-eyed stare showing no hint of emotional disturbance. There was a lot of stuff going on at the time. He responded, rubbing the back of his neck and shifting from foot to foot like a nervous schoolboy. I thought my heart was stopping. I was hearing voices and seeing faces in the trees. The voices always came from outside and soon I couldn't tell when people were really speaking to me because they always spoke. The voices told me that her blood would heal my heart. It would heal all the damage done, and so I got a glass and put it under the bullet hole, and I drank it. I did it, I admit it. I see now that I was sick and that I was wrong. Even if she was cheating on me, she didn't deserve to die. But sometimes things get, well, they get a little crazy and confused, and when that happens, sometimes I get a little crazy and confused too, and I make bad choices. I've been in nut house after nut house since then. The last seven years of my life, I've been shuffled around from one psych ward to another. I've been in mental hospitals where they keep you underground and you never see the light of day ever. Then, three days ago, the doctor said I was getting a transfer. I had responded well to my antipsychotics and cognitive behavioral therapy, he said, and I would be going to a place with more freedom. They drove me here in a closed van with no windows. I couldn't see where we were going. Some guy in a black suit and sunglasses sat in the back with me, not talking. Then when we pulled in, he leaned close to me and said the strangest damn thing. Remember to follow the rules, he said. In whiting, the danger is real. It's not in your head. I gave him an odd look, then he shuffled me outside. I saw this building, this one we're in right now. From the outside, it looks like a concrete cube. 
It has no windows whatsoever and only one door. It's just plain, smooth, gray concrete on the outside, like some kind of government building from 1980. Then he stopped speaking, cocking his head to the side. I thought I heard some dragging far down the hall. We need to keep moving. It's not a good idea to stay in one place out here like this. And with that, he shepherded me through the silver gray metal door labeled Stairway. The dark staircase loomed in front of us like a curtain of shadows. As my eyes adjusted to the dim lighting, I noticed they were switchback stairs, or stairs that went in abrupt 180 degree turns with flat landings between each of the sections. Narrow trickles of light streamed in through cracks in the doors and holes eaten in the walls. The door started to close behind me, but as it swung by in the darkness, I caught a glimpse of four bloody chips stuck into the wood. I grabbed it by the edge and leaned closer, inspecting the strange, slightly curved objects. My breath caught in my throat when I realized they were bloody human fingernails. It looked like someone had tried to claw their way through the door in sheer animal panic. Move, Freddy whispered, breaking me out of my horrified reverie, and close that goddamn door, now. I didn't need to be told twice. Just the thought of what happened last time, I left the door open and made my heart turn into a block of ice. I silently pushed it closed. Holding the severed hand clenched tightly in his fist, Freddy walked forward, haltingly taking steps down. He kept looking behind him up and down like a child checking for monsters under the bed, but here the monsters were real. I heard a predatory inhalation that clicked and gurgled from the floor beneath us, seeming to go on for a long time. Freddy turned pale and I had the sudden urge to just turn around and run. I didn't want to see what was waiting below. I looked down and caught a glimpse of something totally alien peeking up at me. Its round, crimson head disappeared in a blur, but I knew it was stalking us. Just keep walking, Freddy said through gritted teeth, his eyes wide. I didn't know if he was talking to me or himself. He held out the dismembered hand in front of him as if it were a sacred talisman used to ward off evil spirits. The railing shook slightly and I realized I didn't hear anything. The silence seemed deafening. Then the claws wrapped around the handrail in front of Freddy. The fingers looked like sharp, crimson railroad spikes. Something pulled itself up in front of us, moving as silently as death. I beheld the nightmarish spectacle, looking in awe at the killing machine that loomed over us. The keeper was a dark red, the color of clotted blood. It had no eyes that I could see. It stood seven or eight feet tall. It had a shining, chitinous exoskeleton that formed gently curving ridges over its long torso. I saw two holes for its nasal passages like those of a snake's. Its head pointed forward like some sort of eyeless velociraptor. It had a strange combination of reptilian and insectoid features. As its jaw unhinged, it gave a predatory roar that echoed through the stairwell like thunder. Silver rivulets of saliva dripped from its gaping maw. Dozens of deadly spikes shone in its mouth, each as long as a pencil. They reminded me of the teeth of some monstrous deep-sea abomination, like a dragonfish. I backpedaled, my mortal terror screaming at me to turn and run. As soon as I had taken a single step backwards, though, the creature's head ratcheted towards me in a blur, moving so fast that it seemed like a machine more than an animal. It took a step toward me, ignoring Freddy. A low growl rumbled out of its chest. I felt it in my bones. The stairs seemed to shake as it grew in intensity. I stared into the eyeless face as it lowered its sharp fangs towards me, making clicking sounds in its throat. It exhaled fumes that smelled like blood and sulfur directly into my face, but I didn't dare even blink. Freddy threw the dismembered hand between me and the keeper. It jerked its head, twitching back and forth from me to the piece of pale gore on the ground in front of it. It began gnashing its teeth, chittering in an alien tongue. It snapped up the hand from the ground like a toad snatching a fly from the air. I heard the crunching of bones as its sword-like teeth crushed it, sending out a spattering of blood that splashed onto my face. I didn't dare wipe it off, though. 
I stood as still as a corpse, watching and waiting. Freddy loomed behind the keeper, sweating heavily, his eyes wild, his whole body trembling. The keeper gave one last rumbling, clicking growl before jumping up onto the railing. Using its claws, it climbed up and out of sight in a blur. The railing shook under its weight as I started forward again, feeling like a man who had just stared the angel of death in the face and lived to tell the story. We came out on the first floor. I carefully closed the door behind me, making sure it clicked shut. I didn't want anything from that stairwell or those upper floors going through it. Ah, uh, I could use some water after that, Freddy said, his rubbery lips forming the faintest trace of a smile. But honestly, there are worse things in here than the keeper. I feel like if I had enough time, maybe I could domesticate the keeper, like some sort of alien dog. Yeah, yeah, you could give it treats of human fingers and hearts when it sits or rolls over, I said, rolling my eyes. A large room opened up to our left, and Freddy sped walked right in. I had to practically jog to catch up. I saw tables flipped over and rotten food scattered all over the floor. Patches of orange and red and black mold grew wild like trees in a jungle. A dead body lay in the center of the cafeteria, a woman in the same outfit as Freddy and me. Blood seeped from a deep wound in her back. Oh my god, I said, and Freddy just ignored the corpse. He started to walk past without a downwards glance. But then, the corpse moved. I heard choked, ragged breathing. I ran forward to the injured woman, flipping her over. Her eyes were rolling and her teeth were chattering. More blood kept spilling out of the wound, forming a spreading puddle around her torso. She inhaled deeply and seemed to come back for a few moments. Her eyes came back down and then focused on me. She squinted, blearily flicking her eyes from me to Freddy. I, I almost got out, she said, giving a faint smile. Frothy blood bubbled from her lips. It's in the key room. The key to the front door is there. It's in the back. On a big black metal chain. But there's a guard. Her eyes widened at the memory. Oh God, the guard. The whites of her eyes gleamed brightly as they rolled back in her head. She began to seize, kicking her feet, clenching her fingers. After a few seconds of this, she stopped. Her head fell limply to the side and she gave a long, shuddering death gasp. I looked up at Freddy, a rising surge of hope mixing with the horror of this innocent woman's death. He had an excited, manic look on his face. Jesus, the key room, he whispered excitedly. Of course there's a key for the front door. I wonder who told her where it was. Well, let's go get it, I said excitedly. Yeah, yeah, after we eat and drink something, Freddy said, gesturing to the kitchen with his head. I need some strength, and you act like it's so simple. Do you have any idea what the guard will do to us if he catches us sneaking around the key room? What is it, like a human security guard? I asked, though deep down I knew better. Freddy laughed a sardonic giggle. Yeah, okay, he said, sneering. A human? No. Nothing here is ever normal. I caught a glimpse of the guard once and, well, you'll probably see for yourself soon enough, but it's horrifying. That thing definitely ain't fucking human. There was barely any food in the kitchen. We found a jar of old peanut butter and started eating it. The fridges were filled with rotting meat and clotted, moldy dairy products. They emitted a sickening odor that seemed to seep into every corner of the room. The water tasted soapy and a little off, but I was so thirsty that I barely noticed, chugging cup after cup. The key room's just down the hall, Freddy said, looking even paler and more nervous than in the stairwell. She was right. It's the only way. We have to get past the guard and get out of here. If we die here, no one will ever know what happened. I nodded, but my stomach was doing backflips. My heart palpitated in my chest as waves of fear shook me to the core. We walked past broken medical carts, shattered bottles, bloody knives, and pieces of skin and gore that drew clouds of thick, black flies. The entire building smelled like a death camp. I felt that the smell of rotten meat and decaying bodies had likely filtered into my clothes by now. The key room was marked by a large sign. It had a wooden door with a safety glass window smeared with streaks of blood in the shape of a handprint. It did not seem like a favorable omen. 
As we got to the door, Freddy then turned to me. In and out, amigo, he said curtly. No fucking around. You got it? We go to the back, find the key on the big metal chain, and we run. If the guard comes, we split up. At least one of us should get out alive. I took a deep breath and bent over. I don't know if I can do this, man. I am fucking terrified right now. And the rules say not to go in the key room, and it seems like breaking them leads to some crazy shit happening. He shrugged. I knew we didn't have a choice, and I nodded. Okay, let's do this before my nerves totally shatter. He quietly flung open the door and we went inside. Thousands of keys glittered on the walls around us. Rows of cabinets divided up the huge room all the way to the back. Freddy quietly sprinted towards the back and I followed close behind, my head on a swivel, and I didn't see anything. We got to the back and began sifting through hundreds of keys on a desk. I saw one at the end with a massive round steel chain attached to it and I sprinted over to it. Then, a creature walked around the corner. Something humanoid in a black night watchman's uniform, but the creature had no eyes or nose. Its skin was smooth and white over its face, traced with a spider webbing of black veins. It grinned, showing off two long vampiric fangs dripping with blood. The eyeless guard brought his hands up. To my horror, I saw giant dark eyes in the center of both of his palms. The large pupils flitted to me and then to Freddy. The eyes on the hands blinked as the guard opened his mouth and gave an eerie, high-pitched shriek. I grabbed the key, turning to run for my life. Freddy and I split up, each sprinting through a different path past the open key cabinets that loomed overhead. I had my knife clenched tightly in one hand and key in the other. Something hit me from behind and I went flying toward the door. No, Freddy shrieked, turning the corner and leaping over me in a few bounding steps. He had his knife raised and I flipped onto my back trying to raise the knife as the guard looked down, his smooth hairless face as white as freshly cut marble. Freddy then crashed into it, bringing the blade down into the center of its head as he did so. The knife quivered there, shaking like a leaf. With a roar... The guard grabbed Freddy and yanked his neck back. Its vampiric fangs shot out like the teeth of a rattlesnake. They sunk deeply into his jugular, and blood spurted from the wound as I jumped up. I ran toward the guard with my knife out in front of me, intending to cut his throat. Its eyes on its hand glared at me, and the giant hand came up and smacked me. I fell, and the knife went flying. Freddy's breaths had then started to become slow, a regular gurgling by this point. His legs gave out and he collapsed, but the guard held him in its arms like a lover, drinking every drop of blood down to the dregs. I was faint and on the verge of vomiting, and I sprinted out the door of the key room toward the front of the building. I found that the key worked. The sunlight streamed in, beautiful and warm, and I was surrounded by rolling hills in the middle of nowhere. It took me a long time to hitchhike out of that place, but I remember the way back. I went to the police, but... They just laughed at me and called me insane. I just need somebody to believe me. That place is hell on earth, literally, and it needs to be shut down. It needs to be stopped before any more unsuspecting people get sent there. And I'd like to get the body back of the man who saved my life. It's no psychiatric ward. It's a fucking place for the damned.